Good morning and welcome to the Business Leadership Council Annual Breakfast. My name is Laura Roden, and I'm proud to be one of the members of this year's Gala Breakfast Committee, along with my co-chairs Neil Fink, Deborah Lopez, and Deborah Bogards. This breakfast is made possible only through the very passionate efforts of three constituencies, our volunteers, our community, and our sponsors. And I'd like to name some of the individuals who particularly drove this year's effort. I'm going to read some names and please hold applause till the end. In our volunteer community, who leads Business Leadership Council events day to day, month to month, year to year. I'd like to thank Robert Blum, our chair, Marsha Rubin, our vice chair, Randy Maycock and Jeff Zlot, heads of our fundraising committee, Scott Harrison and Ina Miller, head of our programming committee, Rob Scher, head of membership development in our mentoring program, and Hildy Shandell and Ron Lissack, head of our nomination and governance committee. And of course, all of the many, many volunteers who work with our leaders to make everything we do possible. In our, in our community, I'd like to thank for attending today, Scott Wiener from San Francisco's District 8. <laughs> and Tom Kasten, the mayor of Hillsboro. <laughs> as well as Jewish Community Federation current and past board presidents, Nancy Grand, Adele Corvin, and Jim Koshland. <clears throat> and our sponsors who underwrite today's breakfast as well as Business Leadership Council events throughout the year. I'd like to name BNY Wealth Management, and in particular, thank Amy Millman for her continuing passion and support. Cartelligent, thanks very much to David Shapiro. Dwayne Morris, thanks to the commitments of Tom Berliner, Bill Berman, Bob Feynman, Lisa Spiegel, and Shlomo Franco. Rothstein Cass, thanks to Sandy Statler and Seth Blackman. Siler LLP, thanks to Michael Goldstein and his team, and Sterling Bank and Trust, and the Seligman Family Foundation, thanks to Scott Seligman. May I ask for one round of applause and thanks for all of these individuals' support. Thank you. Now, before we move into this morning's exciting agenda, one final note. Please mark your calendars now for next year. We are delighted to announce today that March 7th, 2013, at our annual Gala Breakfast, our keynote will be Charles Bronfman of the Seagram co Group and co-founder of Taglet Israel, which has brought more than 250,000 young people to Israel to explore their heritage. So March 7th, 2013, I look forward to seeing you there. Now I'd like to invite Scott Harrison, co-chair of the BLC Programming Committee, to the podium to join me in the Hamotzi. So I'll uh, lead the singing in Hebrew, and then Scott will um, read the prayer in English. So please sing with me. Baruch Adonai. Eloheinu melech haolam, amotzi lehem min haoretz. Amen. You gave me the easy part. <laughs> Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. All right. Enjoy the breakfast. Cool. 
For those of you who don't know me, I'm Lynn Bunham. I'm a member of the BLC. Welcome again. And before I commence my formal remarks, I would like to acknowledge first and foremost that the Jewish Community Federation's board president, Nancy Grand, is with us this morning. <laughs> Woohoo! What's really wonderful is that Nancy is a highly successful businesswoman in her own right. Thank you, Nancy, for the leadership you've given to the Federation this year, to the support you've given to the BLC, and aren't we lucky that your support for BLC just comes naturally. <laughs> BLC, connecting the business community to the Jewish Community Federation, past, present, and future, can be summed up in two words. Lador Vador, generation to generation. The BLC's roots go back a number of generations. And we're very fortunate this morning to have no less than a half a dozen families with two generations of business leaders here in the audience. Now, I know I'm going to name a few families, and I know there are others as well, but this category today is for those who've been affiliated with the BLC over the years. George and Daniel Frankenstein, Lisa Gerwich and her son Max Fleischer, Richard and Peter Rosenberg, Raziel and Irv Unger, and Bob Wolf gets the cake. He has a son and a son-in-law here, as well as Harold and Jeff Slot. Next year, bring your daughter, bring your son, bring your parent, and maybe even bring your grandparents, and we can have three generations to celebrate Lador Vador. Some here today will recall when the business leaders organized themselves by profession. Doctors, attorneys, financial planners, real estate developers. Then came the 1990s, and it was executives like Richard Rosenberg, Ron Kaufman, who realized that more networking could be done, better business relationships could be built and accomplished if the silos were disbanded and a bigger tent was created. That tent was called the Jewish Community Federation Business and Professional Division. Fast forward many years. Come with me to 2003. That was the year the BLC was formed. By then, the landscape in the business community, the Jewish business community, had changed. There were dozens upon dozens of young professionals who didn't grow up here in San Francisco like the previous generations. They arrived, and they wanted to do business with their Jewish peers and other lines of business than their sales, but they couldn't find them. Well, look around your table, look around this room today. The BLC has found those business women and men. And BLC has become the place where Jewish leaders are able to do one-stop investing. Through BLC, you can invest personally for professional connections among your Jewish peers. You can also invest collectively with us to ensure the sustainability of our Jewish community. On behalf of the Federation, I want to acknowledge that every single person here this morning has made a pledge or already donated a minimum gift of $1,000 to the 2012 campaign. On behalf of everybody at Federation, I want to express our tremendous appreciation for your generosity. As chair of this year's Executive Allocations Committee, I can ensure you that every dollar contributed is going to be invested very wisely and with great purpose to serve the most important needs here and abroad. And as for investing your professional skills to help the community, well, we could be likened to a mutual fund. Because in addition to the Federation, we have numerous nonprofits and gosh knows how many issues. So that no matter what your personal interest or passion might be, I think we have the right fund for you. And if you're like a novice investor and you seek leadership training or would like to have a mentorship opportunity, we have now added these opportunities to our BLC portfolio. Among those in the audience today, we have a number of men and women, business women and women, who have been mentors and mentees. In some cases, we have the pairs here, and in some cases, we have just half because they're working hard. But I want to call out one mentee in particular, and he doesn't know I'm going to do this. His grandmother does, and I'm told he didn't spill the beans. So I want to call out David Sachs. He is a wonderful example of Lador Vador. Like his grandfather of blessed memory, who many of us knew, George Sachs, and his grandmother, Dorothy, 
along with his, where is David? I can't see. Okay, great. Um, along with his parents, Lauren and Shelley, who consistently give to our community, he came to the BLC a few years ago and he engaged with us. He is being mentored and I'm allowed to announce he's the president-elect now of the YAD. And if that's not enough, he's doing exactly what we hoped our young leaders would do, which is go out into the community. He's become involved with the community, sorry, the Contemporary Jewish Museum, where he's involved with the contemporaries. And I understand he's done two amazing out-of-order satyrs. I hope I got that right, out-of-order satyrs. So at your table, if you would like to be David Sachs or anybody else that we are proud to claim in our BLC tent, you have an opportunity men or women. Do you have a sister, David? Do you have a sister? No, okay. Anyway, the point is, you have a card at your table. If you would like to make 2012 the year that you become involved with us, I hope you'll do so. We have lots of professionals to help you. I'd just like to close on a personal note. My own journey with the Jewish community started some 35 years ago, and it all started with a very simple thing. I woke up one day and said, I think it's time to try something new. The rewards have been priceless. Personal satisfaction, professional growth, and a number of friends. Many of you are here today. As I look at the audience from the podium, I'm reminded that BLC will be 10 years old next year. And fortunately, I can see, as I look about, many new, definitely younger faces. And that bodes well for the tradition of Lador Vador and for the BLC. So thank you for being here on behalf of the BLC. And now it's my great pr pleasure and privilege to introduce the Jewish Community Federation CEO, Jennifer Gorovitz. I'd like to invite her to come up to the stage. She's been with the Jewish Community Federation since 2004. She's held a number of senior positions, including being our own CEO since 2009. Jen is a recognized business leader. Make no mistake about that. She's a Business Times woman who's been recognized as being one of the most influential and she has her own Lador Vador story that goes back four generations to her great-grandfather, one of the founding generations of the Hebrew Free Loan Association. Join me in welcoming Jen. Lynn, as always, thank you for your, for your incredibly eloquent remarks. You are a tough act to follow. I want to welcome all of you today. It's great to be back at the Four Seasons and to see all of you here. I want to give a special shout out to BLC. Members of this group are an invaluable group of Jewish leaders, always ready to volunteer your time, to give generously of your resources, so that the innovation and the progress that is so vital to the private sector can be applied to our Jewish community as well, to improve the health, welfare, and meaning of Jewish life for Jews around the world. BLC has always featured speakers who are innovators, trailblazers who have literally changed the face of an industry, and yet who manage to maintain strong ethics and a connection to philanthropy and the Jewish community. Today's speaker, Mitch Kaper, provides an inspiring example of the strong nexus between innovation and philanthropy. He reminds us that for those with a spiritual or cultural passion, the jump from making progress for profit's sake to making progress for the betterment of society is a short one, and for him, clearly an easy one. Mitch's drive for change and innovation also brings to mind a well-worn quote from business management circles, lead, follow, or get out of the way. That was Thomas Paine's advice in his writings on the eve of the Revolutionary War, a moment in the history of this country when we as a nation sought to transform our society profoundly. It remains a quintessential sentiment and reality, particularly in today's world, where the competition is global and both companies and governments rise and fall on a day's news. Charitable organizations were not always so driven by the lessons of business and innovation. Those days are gone. Replaced by an urgent need for organizations such as the Federation to adapt, to resonate with the new generation, to move nimbly, to adopt the best practices from business and leadership experts to stay as relevant to donors as any brand on Main Street. And so it is that the Federation now has a new grant-making model designed to impact not just individual organizations but entire spheres of Jewish life. 
the Caper Foundation itself has taken this kind of systemic approach to sustainable communities, affordability, and the electoral process. Like Mitch and members of the BLC, the Federation is choosing to lead, not to follow, and not to stand idly by as the Jewish world and the philanthropic world change so dramatically around us. There are no little steps, no tiny gestures, when we choose to stand at the head of the line. So where are we? I'd like to provide you with an example of just one of three community-wide initiatives we've begun to fund this year. We are taking the lead on a major issue in our community, Jewish families priced out of the Jewish experience. Imagine that you were never able to be part of a synagogue, a camp, a school, an immersive ser service opportunity like American Jewish World Service. Imagine not a single childhood memory of community involvement. Would you be sitting here today? At some point in your lives, somehow, you internalized that being Jewish matters. It matters to you, it matters to your family, and you have become part of a community. Today, at least one in 10 Jewish children in our service area, which by the way is 2,400 square miles, lives below the poverty line, which means that for these families, engaging in Jewish life has become a luxury they cannot afford. I'm sure you agree that this is simply not acceptable. Frankly, for many middle-class families, compelling Jewish experiences like overnight camping are beyond reach. That's why the Federation is committed to ensure that each and every child can have the compelling Jewish experiences that will form their values, their identities, and help ensure that we have a strong and vibrant Jewish future. This is an example of just one of the big issues we will fund this year and beyond. As we build the model, you will see big goals, clear results we expect to see, and their real costs. Next, we're taking the lead in the challenge of ensuring next generation engagement and Jewish innovation weaving them together through the model that we designed called the Impact Grants Initiative, the IGI. This new model was featured in the Business Times last year as an experiment and is now a successful reality. Our young people in the current venture philanthropy cohort between the ages of 21 and 28 are funding innovative projects in their peer group, that is serving 21 to 28 year olds in the Jewish community. They are becoming leaders whose philanthropy is strategic, personal, and results-driven. They are learning about best practices in grant making, about the most pressing needs in our community, and how Jewish values inform and enrich their grant making for the highest impact. This approach is so engaging and effective that we are applying it to our regions to solve big local challenges and to our young adult Russian community for micro-grants in Russian engagement. I want to also tell you about another very exciting project. In our role in the balcony of this thriving Jewish community, we are not only funding systemic changes that must be tackled from 30,000 feet, but we're also building the capacity of any and all Jewish community organizations through a powerful partnership that we have established with LinkedIn. Because of the bold move taken by one young man in our marketing department to conceive of LinkedIn as the engine to power our community to create a matchmaking portal of pro bono experts to the agencies who need them. LinkedIn loved the idea so much, which by the way, he just tweeted to LinkedIn, that they have created a national pilot. So fortunately, since it was our idea, we've been selected to be part of this national pilot and, and one of 12 nonprofits nationally to be part of the, it's called the LinkedIn for Nonprofits pilot program. We've received thousands of dollars of free access to premium LinkedIn features, and we're putting them to work in our newly launched pro bono consulting group on LinkedIn, which I encourage all of you to use so that we can match highly skilled professionals in our community with the nonprofit organizations who so desperately need them. And finally, I want to mention our funding of innovative startups. There are more than a dozen organizations, startups with dynamic, thoughtful, young Jewish leaders who are looking for ways to have dazzling impact on Jewish interests and identity. And we are only too happy to support them to create the Jewish world of tomorrow. They are the future and they need all of us. You may never have heard of some of them before. Keva, Upstart, Moisha House, Hazon, Storytelling, Godcast, Keshet, Limud, The Idelson Society, Wilderness Torah, InterfaithFamily.com, and the San Francisco Teen Outreach Program. 
and we have others in Israel and overseas. In close, I've given you just a small snapshot of the big directional shifts at the Federation and the new Jewish world we are helping to ignite. A healthy Jewish community is sustained not by attention to the sexiest one or two organizations, but by hard-driven systemic change and by enabling individual flowers to take root and grow. Last night, I asked my 15-year-old daughter what would happen without a federation? What would happen if each person had only one or two favorite causes to support? She said, Mommy, that would be like having a garden where you let all of your plants wither and you water only the ones that look brightest to you or the shortest distance from your hose. In 10 or 20 years, I do not want to see weeds growing in front of an empty JCC or a defunct Jewish home de defunded by government and forgotten by its community. Nor do I want to see closed camps overgrown by the wild or another generation with little or no connection to Israel. Not one of us can do it alone. Not one of them can go it alone. Each one of us must depend on the other for our garden to thrive. We've come too far to be complacent now, to think that the internet provides all the information that we need, to think that 2,000 years of collective action have come to an end. I won't give up on us. We're not content to get out of the way or to follow other organizations. There is no other organization like us. There is no other organization who sustains the whole garden, our Jewish ecosystem. So I hope you will be there with us as we work to build a healthy, vibrant, and enduring Jewish community here in Israel and around the world, as we've done for the past 102 years and plan to do for the next. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Those are uh, pretty compelling reasons for the existence of Ju uh, the Jewish Federation, and um, it makes us really want to be continually to be involved. And it's also a great segue about our what we're doing currently and who our speaker is, uh, especially when we talked about our efforts digitally. So my name is Neil Fink. I'm on the steering committee of the Business Leadership Council, and I'm a co-chair of today's event uh, with Laura Roden. And when Laura called me to tell me that Mitch K. Poor had accepted our invitation to speak at this year's breakfast, I was, I was really delighted. And, and, it, and it wasn't just because, because he led the company that developed one of the most successful and perhaps one of the most impactful pieces of software in history. And, and, it, and it wasn't just because he, Mitch contributed to the blueprint of the National Information Infrastructure or, or co-founded the Electronic Freedom Foundation and is the chair of the Mozilla Foundation, creator of Firefox. And it, and it wasn't just because he continues to have a vision to recognize and fund disruptive companies that use technology for positive social change. But it was because his life and what he has done and continues to do really embodies what, what we believe as the Jewish Federation's Business Leadership Council is, is, is the a belief, it's a belief that we can be successful in the business world and still continue to practice concurrently and consistently to Kunalom and Sadaka. And, and Mitch has demonstrated that for his entire career. And those Sadaka to Kunalom are core Jewish values. When Mitch founded uh, Lotus Development Corporation in 1982 and a year later, Lotus was the second largest software company behind Microsoft. He led the company through its IPO, and the company was ultimately sold for three and a half billion dollars. But software was not the only thing the company pioneered. Lotus hired Freya Klein as the first director of employee relations with a mandate to ensure a fair workplace. And Lotus opened a daycare center was voted by Working Mothers Magazine as the best place for working mothers to work, was the first major corporation to sponsor an aid walk, and was the first major corporation to provide full benefits for same-sex couples. Now, Mitch became an early stage investor, first with a partner with Excel Partners, and now as a partner with Kpor Capital, where he continues to invest in companies that provide social good and social change. Importantly, 
Mitch is a hands-on philanthropist. He's a trustee of the Mitch K. Poor Foundation and a director of Level Playing Field, which my understanding was founded by that same Frida Klein, who is now Frida K. Poor Klein, sitting at the table right there. Uh, now, I, I can go on and on about Mitch's services, his, his, uh, the companies that he's founding now, his involvement in Wikimedia, which, uh, which Wikipedia is found part of, and the, the Metapedia project, which is dedicated to advancing medical knowledge, uh, and the fact that he's been a visiting adjunct professor and at Cal and, and MIT and written articles for the New York Times and Forbes and Scientific American, but um, I, I know you want to hear from Mitch. So, uh, designer, investor, uh, entrepreneur, uh, advocate, philanthropist, please welcome Mitch Kapoor. Well, thank you so much. What a wonderful introduction. And it's a great honor <coughs> to be here with you today. I am fighting some allergies, so I'm actually going to pour myself a little water. So what I'd like to do today is briefly talk a bit about my own story, where, where I came from and how it fed my career uh, and my philanthropy. And I can really sum up the main themes here in, in two questions. One is, how does an outsider become successful? And second, what does a successful outsider do? with that success. So let's travel back. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> this would be fifth or sixth grade. That was me. My sister is sitting here. She just startled, hasn't, hasn't, hasn't seen this in a while. Um, I actually began as a double outsider. First, we Jews are and have been a marginalized people. In Eastern Europe, which is where my family came from, we were, of course, restricted where we could live and where we could work. We were targets of persecution and violence, and that was the impetus for many of our families, including my own, to come to America. You don't get much more outside than that. And interestingly, America as the land of opportunity which it is, we shouldn't forget that Jews were also outsiders here. I recently learned that um, as recently as just a couple of years before I went to Yale as an undergraduate, which was in 1967, so when I graduated from high school, up through 1965, Yale still had a Jewish quota. It was the last of the Ivy League schools to uh, uh, drop uh, the Jewish quota. But in addition to my Jewish background, my personal experience in life growing up was shaped by being a target of bullying in uh, my schools. Not helped by the fact that while I was academically advanced and so skipped second grade, I was thus a couple of years younger than everyone else with uh, average social skills, and in that time, in that place, bullying was not uh, at all uncommon. And I, it really put me on the outside of the outside in my school system growing up, the Freeport Public Schools on, on Long Island. And I was reflecting on this lately because there was a news story about one of the presidential candidates, who shall go unnamed, uh, back in high school, and it was reported that he led a a pack of kids who chased down and tackled a kid who was different um, uh, and cut off his dyed blonde hair. Uh, and when that came to light, there was a wonderful op-ed by Charles Blow in the New York Times that I cannot improve on 
because it so spoke articulately for my own experience as being a target, which is that if that incident happened, as described, it wasn't a prank, it wasn't even bullying, it was an assault. To chuckle about it in the present day is insensitive. And not to remember having committed that is almost unimaginable. And an apology based on if I hurt someone misses the point that it is a horrible thing to do regardless of the impact. And today, it was a terrible lost opportunity for a teachable moment about bullying and a very poor example of how to address a mistake made. The sage Hillel said, that which is hateful to you do not do to your fellow. That is the whole Torah. The rest is the explanation. Go and learn. And that kind of sums up that incident. And I can tell you my outsiderness was shaped by my family's tradition and heritage and the particular things that happened to me. I took refuge in numbers. I'm a kind of a mathematical sort of guy. I have a lot of talent there. And I managed to create a safe space away from a lot of the social interaction by learning to be good at math and solving problems and being on the math team and, and building my identity around that. And then the 1960s came and I wandered. So <laughs> I had opportunities that came from growing up in the middle class. There's some privilege there. There was economic security. I grew up in the culture of the 60s. I was at Woodstock. I was a disc jockey in college. Uh, spent my time at the Yale radio station and then did that professionally. And then finally, I became a meditation teacher of transcendental meditation. So I was one of those lost, lost souls through the 60s and, uh, uh, and 70s. And that um, changed. And it changed when the personal computer came out. There was something about the PC. It was just waiting for me. It was a kind of a romance. And back when it was still a hobbyist sort of thing in the 1970s, long before there were any PCs used in, in business, I developed the conviction that everybody was going to have a personal computer, that they were going to become indispensable tools of personal empowerment. And this was a completely crazy idea. Nobody else believed it at the time, but I just felt it, and my perspective sitting perched on the edge of things, looking to what was coming next, gave me some advantage. And I was fortunate to be able to start a company and that was Lotus Development and create an application that was Lotus123. It was the killer app, as they say, that brought the desktop computer to the business world in the 1980s. And we grew the company. It was, it was a small version of today's Googles and Facebooks. We grew to hundreds of millions of dollars and thousands of employees in literally a couple of years. And that was a huge... And totally unexpected professional accomplishment uh, on my part. So here we are in the Lotus position again some 30 years later. Uh, my unlikely path led to some very remarkable recognition. This is the Entrepreneur's Walk of Fame, uh, which was just uh, unveiled in Kendall Square, Cambridge, right near Lotus uh, uh, last, uh, last fall. I was in some very distinguished company of Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, who were honored, and Hewlett and Packard, and a couple of others. And there's a quote, uh, which uh, is uh, Frida and I authored together, that's on the sidewalk there. It's right next to the tea stop near the Kendall Square Hotel. Uh, and the quote I want to read to you is, building a workplace which engages a diversity of employees and brings out their best makes a far greater contribution than financial success alone. And that is what I am proud of at Lotus and what I want people to remember. It was the culture that we made. 
its impact on the thousands of employees who were there, our efforts not just to talk the talk about practicing good values, but judging ourselves by how well we walked the walk. One thing we did actually is we literally tied a portion of managers' bonuses to how well their reports evaluated them putting the corporate values into actual practice. That's walking the walk. Um, and I'm very proud of the work that we did, some of which uh, Neil uh, uh, thoughtfully talked about in the introduction, so I won't get over, I won't go over again in terms of building a diverse culture and really standing up as a good corporate citizen. Well, a lot happened. It's been a lot of years since Lotus, which was in the early and mid-1980s. And in 1999, Frida and I moved here to the Bay Area. And one of the things that happened when we came here is that Frida, who is a graduate of UC Berkeley, uh, was appointed to the advisory board at the College of Letters and Science there. And in that context, heard about what had happened to the enrollments of uh, students of color since Prop 209, which banned affirmative action, and the uh, diversity uh, completely plummeted. And she was moved with some of her colleagues to begin a scholarship program to uh, help address that, a private scholarship program, since state funds can't be used, uh, to help support once admitted uh, students of color at, from low-income communities at uh, at Berkeley to help them succeed to graduate and to go on. Uh, and I became a supporter of that, uh, an ardent supporter. One interesting statistic there, Pell Grants, which go to students from low-income communities. There are more Pell Grant students at UC Berkeley than at the entire Ivy League and Stanford combined. It really is a gateway school. And we have supported uh, many, many uh, uh, graduates from UC Berkeley. I was just at the uh, graduation of the Ideal Scholars, Ideal is Initiative for uh, Diversity in Education and Leadership, the name of the program. Many of them have gone on to law school, to medical school. One of our students is graduating from Harvard uh, Medical School this week. It's, it's, it's uh, quite, quite moving. I have a very personal connection to these students through my family. Let me explain. This is a picture of my father when he was, I think, about 1939, sometime late high school, early college. Um, he grew up very poor in the Depression in Queens, New York. Uh, his father, my grandfather, was a house painter uh, unemployed for a very long time. Uh, period of time, and my father was not expecting to go to college at all. It was just not in the picture. He was, in fact, the first to go, and he went to City College of New York, CCNY, because it was free. It was a public university. It was the University of California system of its day. It was the gateway school, and it had a mission as a public institution to lift up students who were first in family to go to college. And he became, uh, he got an engineering degree. And he went on to serve his country in World War II in the Navy. He became a, a, a business person. I am the beneficiary of all of this. I wouldn't be here if he hadn't done what he had done. And he could not have done that if there wasn't a strong and vibrant public education system. And so all I am doing is practicing an ethic of reciprocity, of doing unto others as I would have them do unto me in supporting these uh, students at UC Berkeley. But I want to tell you that my commitment, it's more personal and it goes deeper than this. And I want to dive into that by going back in time again. So seated, that is me uh, at age 15. Um, and I am uh, at a program called SSP, the Summer Science Program, which was in the first time I ever came to California. I grew up on Long Island. This was an astronomy program in Southern California. The US was trying to catch up to the Russians, who had launched Sputnik, and there was a missile gap, and there was funding for programs to take kids with high potential in math and science. And I should say, back in 66, kids meant boys, not girls. Uh, 
And I was in a six-week program that changed my life. I had hands-on exposure to computers for the first time. And the thing in the back on the right is not an oil burner. <laughs> it's a first-generation 1950s vintage uh, computer, uh, 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 a Bendix G15. And that was the first computer that I actually uh, programmed. I'm, I'm sitting at, 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 at the keyboard, which was a, a, a typewriter keyboard. Six weeks changed my life, set me on the path that I went on in life. Fast forward, this is a young woman named Nico. This is, she is also seated at a keyboard. It's some 30 plus years later. She is getting hands-on exposure to computers in a summer program that focuses on developing students to go into the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it is at a program called SMASH, the Summer Math and Science Honors Academy, co-founded by my wife, Frida, that um, has become very centrally important to us in our lives. This is my one text slide. I said, it's a breakfast talk. I'll have some slides, but they're going to be pictures because it's breakfast. But this is important enough to make a little exception. So SMASH is a three-year summer program uh, for low-income high school students of color. It takes place on college campuses. Uh, half the students are girls. It's, it's hands-on, it's inquiry-based, and we have a nine-year track record. We started at UC Berkeley. We expanded to Stanford last summer. This summer will also be at UCLA and USC. Next summer, the mayor's office in Chicago has given us funding, and we'll have pro a program or two uh, in Chicago and, and onward uh, from there. And if you want more information, the last line has the URL. But here's, here's the point that I want to make. Look at these two side by side. Me, 1966, Nico, 2009. These kids are not any different than I am. That was my conclusion. If, if you look beyond all the many differences on the surface of age, gender, class, race, it's all about talent that comes in unlikely and outsider packages. These smash kids want the same thing that I wanted. A chance to be accepted for who they are and a chance to make the most of their lives to develop and to contribute. And that's where my connection comes from. And we've learned some things about how you can help. You have to put kids in a setting with their peers so for the first time, they'll be rewarded for who they are and not punished as outsiders for being, for being different. You have to challenge them by setting very high expectations. And you have to give them the support they need to succeed. And if you do that, they will. They will defy any intuition or expectation that kids who look like that can't succeed. And our graduates from our SMASH program are in college and beyond at Berkeley, Stanford. When they come to us at age 14 after ninth grade, many of them have never heard of MIT, and three years later, they're going to MIT. This is pretty rewarding, let me tell you, as well as doing some good in the world. So now, let me talk about the other side of my life, because that's the nonprofit support education, the business side. This is a young woman named Pooja Sankar. We, we hope Miko will grow up to be a Pooja. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, we invest at Cape Work Capital in tech startups that are trying to make the world a better place, having positive social impact. And Pooja has a, an interesting story. Grew up in America, family moved to India, came back here. So she was going to IIT, not the Illinois Institute of Technology, the India Institute of Technology, super selective, hyper competitive, computer science as an undergraduate. And the exclusion she felt there, because there are almost no women in that program, was almost total. 
and it was very scarring. And when she came back and after she went to uh, graduate school in, uh, in business at Stanford, she started a company called Piazza. And if you have kids that are in the STEM fields, uh, they are probably using Piazza because it is spreading like wildfire across college campuses as an online study group discussion forum for technical classes. And the core of the design is to create something so that everybody feels included and nobody is excluded and everybody has a place and it's a welcoming place to ask and answer questions and to be part of a group. Entrepreneurs, it said, scratch their own itches. Entrepreneurs who come from a different kind of background are likely to have a different set of itches and they're likely to be innovative in unexpected and unusual kind of ways and those are the kind of folks that we want to work with. One other entrepreneur. This is Gene Wade. Uh, Gene is the founder of a company called University Now. His life journey started in the housing projects in Roxbury in the Boston area and took him through Harvard Law School and an MBA at Wharton. He's a serial education entrepreneur. University Now is addressing an enormous problem, which is the college affordability problem. I think we've seen the headlines recently. It's a trillion dollars of student debt, something like at least two-thirds of all students, might even be three-quarters, are graduating with significant debt. And for many students who, whose first path in college would be to go to community college, they can't get in, they can't get the classes they want because community colleges have been defunded, particularly uh, in California. University now develops programs, online programs, accredited uh, degree programs that are uh, oriented to, that, that use a competency-based learning model, which means go at your own pace. But the important thing is, and the disruptive innovation is $200 a month. You could get a BA for well less than $10,000, and in fact, if you're a working adult, the lifelong learning credit effectively makes it free. This is a for-profit business. It incorporates this great technology stack done by some Silicon Valley, uh, a, a, a crack team, and it is just, just launching, just rolling out. You'll see things for New Charter University, which this company operates, and there are more You'll see a, a big story coming out very soon in the Wall Street Journal. We love this kind of thing. We love to find and support entrepreneurs that have solid business ideas whose very success is going to create not just economic value, but social value as well. I have two more topics I want to touch on briefly, and then I think I'll be on time and can even take a couple of questions. Let me reflect a little bit about business ethics and Judaism. We celebrate the winners in business, but we often don't think enough about the price of winning. I have always been troubled, personally, by business as usual. I've never been comfortable with treating people as badly as you want and getting away with whatever you can, despite the wonderful products that that often creates. And I've never been comfortable with the end justifying the means. And these guys whom I've uh, known and knew for many decades all understand that's where I come from, and I think I get some respect from them for that. So we try to share this approach with the companies that we work with. The interesting thing was when I very recently started belatedly to do some readings in Judaism, I discovered that I had somehow absorbed Jewish business ethics without knowing it. I guarantee I didn't learn them in Hebrew school. And if they hadn't chained us to our seats there, I wouldn't have stayed in the class. But in reading, when I came across sayings like, 
let your fellow's money be as precious to you as your own, which comes from the pure care vote, I said, that's my philosophy. That is what I believe in and implies a whole set of treating the person on the other side of the transaction, a sale, a negotiation, an investment, with the same respect and dignity that you would want to be treated with. And it's just fundamental. And I must have absorbed it osmotically. It did not happen by accident. And I have to credit the Jewish tradition and what I didn't know that I was learning for making me who I am. And finally, so this is an image that I took of the old city in uh, Jerusalem. It is similar to, though not identical, to the view out my balcony of the King David Hotel, which was a singular moment for me. And this was just a year ago. I had put off going to Israel approximately forever had done a lot of international travel, I just didn't want to deal with all of the contradictions. I did not want to have to deal with my extreme discomfort at both the religious practices and the policies of many uh, uh, in the state of Israel. But Fried and I had a close friend who moved from New York to Jerusalem. We ran out of excuses. She made it very easy. She set up the whole trip. And I got there and stepped out onto the balcony, looked out at the old city and Mount Scopus and so on, and I just burst into tears. I was overcome by a feeling of profound connection to place and people. A very unexpected kind of coming home. I mean, very unexpected. And I realized I could no longer turn my back on my people, even those whose views and practices I do not like and oppose very, very strongly. We had a great visit, met lots of, lots of people. I was very impressed with the peace activists on both sides and with the entrepreneurs and investors who are attempting to create more economic interdependence. Went to the West Bank, spent a day in Ramallah, understand that there is a huge potential to do more than we've done to lift up a people, to build economic ties, and to begin to make uh, a difference in that way. And I'm reminded of another saying from Pirke Avot that I was unaware of until extremely recently. It is not your obligation to complete the task, but neither are you at liberty to desist from it entirely. And that is my feeling about what we are here to do in our lives, in business and in philanthropy. We cannot stand aside. We must engage. We may not get over the finish line, but we are here to do what we can do while we are here. Thank you so much. sure it's on some people's minds. Any questions, hands? Don't be shy. Anybody want to pitch me on a startup? No, just, <laughs> just kidding. While in Israel, did you visit, you visit any of the uh, high-tech startup industry? Uh, I didn't visit, I had some meetings with people. I didn't visit companies so much. I already knew a lot of, a number of entrepreneurs who had come here and gone back and forth, and I'm saving all of that for a grand tour of Israel High Tech on my next, next coming visit. <laughs> the Facebook IPO. Can't imagine why anybody is asking that. It's obviously an enormous creation. In fact, I'm, I'm stunned because my son 
was two years behind Mark Zuckerberg at, at, at Harvard. And my son is doing quite nicely, thank you, as a graduate student in economics at, uh, uh, at Yale, getting his PhD. But I'm going to have uh, built something like Facebook at that age is remarkable. But that is a separate issue from is this a good investment or not? The reason that I just do little tiny startups is because I view the public markets as a gigantic casino. It's very entertaining, but it's sheer speculation. So if you have an appetite for risk and you feel like it would be enjoyable instead of going to the blackjack tables to put a little down on Facebook, more power to you. But I'm not. In, in, in the back. Well, I've heard you speak a couple times actually more about um, the Electronic Freedom Foundation and I was wondering sort of with that in mind if you could talk a little bit about some of where you see say like the Facebook IPO or something like that sort of the future of the internet and the potential and perhaps also how that relates Jewishly Talmud and the internet and those kinds of themes. Oh I can do that in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, Electronic Frontier Foundation EFF committed to civil liberties on networks, the internet, in cyberspace. Um, it's a, an important organization, which I co-founded 20 plus years ago and, and continue to support. The rules are being redrawn about privacy and I'm personally quite unhappy at the way data about our lives is being aggregated and resold without our knowledge or our understanding. And I've worked with Attorney General Harris here to try to bring a little bit more order. And it's a mess. The, the one thing I would say is what we think matters a lot less than what young people in their teens and 20s think. If genuinely they are comfortable with a sort of oversharing that is going on, then societal norms will move. Facebook and everybody else will be pretty much okay. And um, I don't particularly like that. But if you want to do something about that, the locus is to work with the young people who have grown up with this because they have a different experience and perspective on things and what they think and feel as they continue to come of age is going to be much more determinative than any blue ribbon committee or any initiative. And so my advice to EFF and everybody else is work with the grassroots of the digital natives to sort this issue out. There's a person, you have the, there we go. So I liked hearing about your program, SMASH. I also am a graduate of Cal. My daughter is a graduate of Cal. There is growing anti-Semitism on all of our college campuses and at my law school. So I'm just curious, Mr. Kapoor, whether you can broaden SMASH to be both for people of color and maybe Jewish students so there would be more interaction at that level and therefore maybe foster less anti-Semitism at our colleges. So let me say to you plainly, I don't think it's either or. That's my first point. Second, I also want to be clear that in today's world, Jews in America have largely, but not entirely, by any means, completed a journey that low-income people of color have not. And I don't think we can be so self-interested as to look aside at that. We are all fellow human beings. And we invest very heavily because we are interested in closing the gaps between the haves and the have-nots, in, cl in closing gaps of access and opportunity for everyone. That said, there is no question that anti-Semitism continues. It has had a long life, and despite the enormous successes of Jews in America, we would be foolish to think it has gone away entirely. We focus where, you know, we focus because of, we have finite resources, 
But I would say uh, civil discourse and bringing parties together to speak to one another, not to shout at each other or to engage in hateful behavior is incredibly important and we have supported activities on that spectrum for a long time and when that involves anti-Semitism, I would say we are also supportive of trying to close the gaps that separate people and where groups dehumanize each other and we cannot afford to look aside at that either. I have a business question for you. How do you, or how did you, convince your management team or your board to focus not just on the bottom line, but also your company's values? Well, when I wrote my introduction to the venture capitalist, Ben Rosen, who funded Lotus, when I sent him the business plan, I said, I want you to know there are some things that are as important to me as making a profit. So there was a lot of value in that kind of transparency and disclosure. Nobody could say, hey, how are you sneaking this stuff in? Okay. Second point, we were extraordinarily successful early on. In our first year, we did 50 million in, in sales against a forecast of 3 million, so it was a 1,700% favorable error. And we took the company public, and there was very little adult supervision. I was in my early 30s, so there was nobody to say no to. That's the other side of it. So we just went ahead and did it, and it became the reality of the company. And then anybody who looked at it understood that the company's success, that the motivation of the employees was a function of the culture that was created. So by that time, it was too late, really, to, to undo it. So be transparent, be early, and find partners. I tell entrepreneurs, when you bring on an investor, you should be comfortable with them. You should trust them. Don't assume that because they're the money guy, you're just going to have to put up with a lot of crap. You may have to if you choose poorly, but investors exist on a spectrum and work with, work with people with integrity. So all those things make it, uh, make it easier. I suspect I have time for one or two more. So next to last. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on what you see as the limitations of technology in education. Technology in education is not a panacea. There have been previous waves with CD-ROM and multimedia in the 90s. People said, great, this is going to solve all our problems. The kinds of usage of technology in education with the most potential, I think, are ones that are part of blended learning systems, which is to say, a thoughtful combination of computer instruction and teaching. Leveraging teachers by enabling them to do what they're good at, which is coaching and instruction and helping students with problems and freeing them from routine and drudgery and repetition, which machines are quite good at. So rethinking the design of instructional systems in an architecture that brings out the best of what computers can do and the best of what teachers can do is the promising direction. Anything short of that, which is to say expecting to sit your kid down or a kid in front of 10-minute Khan Academy videos, as good as many of those are, and to say that's going to improve educational outcomes and close the access gap, that's, that's very misguided. And so the challenge ultimately is going to be one, not of technology, but of institutional reform. We have some great high-performing schools, charter schools, uh, some of which use technology, some of which don't, that take, that take populations of kids from failure factories who are dropping out and send them all to college. If we're going to scale that, though, so that every kid has that chance and not just, you know, a couple hundred charter schools in, 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 in the U.S., charter and, and public also, and some private, let me be inclusive there. That's institutional reform in which teachers unions are going to play a part and changing school districts will play a part and technology will have some part. 
I worry from the Silicon Valley side that my colleagues are not focused enough on uh, the whole systems picture and will make a mistake that's been made before of betting too heavily that technology by itself is going to change the world. And we thought that was going to happen with personal computers in the 80s, and it, it didn't quite turn out that way. One final question. Yes, in the back, please. Hi. From the sale of Lotus to founding Kapoor Capital, can you speak a little bit about your timeline and your thought process? Did you know right away that you wanted to found this wonderful organization doing the work you do? Did you know right away, or did it take you time to develop that? No, hardly. It took me a long time. I mean, it, really, a decade. And... Um, Frida and I, Frida, just hold your hand up so people can see. There she is. Were professional colleagues in the 80s at Lotus, but I was married to somebody else and a real Boy Scout, and we were only professional colleagues, which is important because she co-founded the first group in the U.S. on sexual harassment. <laughs> but in the mid-90s, I was separated. And we got together as a couple. And I really want to give her credit for being my partner and inspiration and guide, particularly in philanthropy, not particularly, but notably, because she said, why are you not passionate about the things that you're funding? Why is it not more integrated with your core concerns? And she gave me a set of challenges from the mid-90s onward, and we rebooted the foundation completely in a couple of stages. And we created this suite of organizations, Level Playing Field, which she founded, and Cape War Capital, and have worked out the model. It is a work in progress, and we are not, we are not done. But no single inspiration, but a life partner whom I love dearly and a shared commitment to values and lots of hard work with many mistakes, two steps forward, one step back. That's how we've gotten where we've gotten. Thank you so much. Can we give uh, Mitch a great thank you? And also, Mitch, um, the Federation has presented you with some gifts here. I don't know what they are yet. <laughs> but thank you very much to Mitch Kapoor. Thank you, Mitch.